Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Holistic Perspective webinar. Uh, our Holistic Perspective program is about uh, giving a broader understanding of uh, herbs and natural healing modalities and uh, also tools to help us you know, succeed in our, our personal lives. And since it's the middle of summer and everything's out there you know, uh, blooming and people are working outdoors, I decided on this topic of uh, eating the weeds, or basically talking about um, the edible and medicinal uses of common lawn and garden weeds, because you know uh, I, I don't remember the the famous American philosopher who said it, but I think it was uh, might have been Holmes or Emerson or somebody who said a weed is a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered, or another person said a weed is a is a uh, plant that's uh, you know. Uh, growing where someone doesn't want it. But um, a lot of the, you know, the weeds that people grow in their yard, or that are growing in people's lawns and gardens are actually uh, food, and in many cases, uh, medicines, and important medicines that people uh, need. In fact, I remember when I was studying herbs as a teenager, I went to a uh, uh, lawn and garden shop, and I was looking at this bag of of uh, weed and feed fertilizer that people used on their lawns, and it had a picture of 16 different weeds that uh, this killed. And I remember looking at the time, and uh, 14 of those plants I knew were either edible or could be used as medicine. And I believe, with what I understand now, if I, I don't remember the exact list of plants, but I'm pretty sure that every single one of them on that bag was something that could have been used. So. I, I always think it's ironic that we're trying to kill plants that are growing to try to help us. So with that, let's just uh, have a little fun here and talk about some of these plants. And this first one is one that um, I see a lot in people's yards. It's called Black Medic. Um, and it's in the pea family, Fabiaceae or the legume family. Uh, and you can see the picture here. It, it, it's a really, really tiny plant. And it has... A, uh, clover-like like blossom because it's you know related to clovers and it also has uh, clover-like leaf with the, the three leaflets. So the way you identify this is that it has those three leaflets similar to clover but it's much smaller than the white Dutch clover uh, and definitely a lot smaller than the red clover. Um, and again the blossoms are, are clover-like but they're very tiny. I mean they're so tiny that unless you're really looking closely you probably wouldn't even see them see it and I I find this plant in in people's lawns all the time the plant um, sends down very deep deep roots just like alfalfa does which is another member of the, the pea family and therefore it uh, accumulates uh, quite a bit of mineral nutrition and I have uh, eaten this one uh, it's actually pretty tasty uh, clovers in general are edible um, and uh, because it's a uh, got a deep root system like alfalfa. It has many of the same kind of trace minerals and, and properties that alfalfa does, and a lot of the same kind of uh, vitamin content and protein content. Uh, the, the thing about eating all uh, clover kind of plants, like white Dutch clover, which is also growing in a lot of people's lawns, is also edible, is that um, they are kind of a little diff difficult to digest. So if you eat a lot of them, it can kind of uh, give you a little bit of bloating or uh, indigestion. But adding a little bit of any of them to a salad is uh, not going to cause any problems. And it, like alfalfa, it has been used to actually help with arthritis, rheumatism, and ulcers. Um, it contains coumarins, which um, can help lower cholesterol. Coumarins are, uh, when when a uh, plant that contains coumarins spoils, um, it uh, creates coumadins, which are the blood thinning drugs that they use. But coumarins themselves are not blood thinning um, unless they have, uh, uh, you know, been, been rotted. So that alfalfa does that, melote does that, and this plant, because it also contains coumarins, would do that if it's spoiled. So you want to use it fresh. Um, and, and those coumarins do have some negative effects eaten in huge quantities, but again, just like taking a little bit of alfalfa, um, it's not going to do any harm and actually has some anti-infective qualities as well. And like I said, I've, I've munched on these and they're pretty tasty and they're growing all over the place. Now, another one that you'll really commonly see, this is not, of course, growing in people's lawns. This is usually growing 
on the edge of a vacant lot or um, or kind of on the side of the road or somewhere else is uh, burdock, which is in the um, Asteraceae uh, sunflower or daisy family. Um, it has a lot of common names, and it produces these uh, kind of burry flowers, which you can see this plant right here is in bloom, uh, and the little purple uh, specks are, are, are the flowers, little flower heads, and as they uh, uh, mature and go to, and turn to seed, they turn into a little burr that uh, clings to the clothing of people and animals, which is how the plant helps to disperse its seeds, and this plant has very, very large leaves. So the way you identify it, if you don't know what it is, because um, a lot of people I think are probably familiar with this plant, is it's a biennial. So what that means is a biennial, um, which uh, is a plant that lives for two years. Uh, beets are biennials, carrots are biennials, parsnips are biennials. A lot of root crops that we eat for food are biennials. And so what happens is in the first year that the plant grows, all the leaves grow from the crown of the root. So they stay basically close to the ground. So you see that with a carrot, you see that with a, uh, a beet, you see that with a... Um, a parsnip, uh, and, and so the, the leaves come out of the, the crown of the root, and all of them are basically, there's no, there's no stem, in other words, growing upward. So the first year burdock, you'll see just a bunch of leaves, big leaves, in a little uh, circle right near the ground. Uh, during that first year, the plant takes and absorbs nutrition and goes and stores it down in the root. That's why if you want to eat, the roots, you pick them in the first year because the plant is storing all this um, sugar and nutrients for the next year. Once the winter has passed and the next spring comes up, then the plant sends up a shoot, which is designed to produce flowers, which then produce the fruits and the seeds. And all of the nutrition that was stored in the root during the first year is sucked out of the root in order to give the plant the energy it needs to go to flower and produce seeds. So the roots become kind of woody, and they lose their sweetness, and they get kind of inedible. So the key is is that you don't want to pick the burdock during the time when it's got the flowers and seeds and big like that because it's it's lost a lot of its uh, power. You the ideal time to dig the burdock is uh, late summer, early fall during the first year, so that you can um, get all of the value in the roots. Uh, burdock is still used as, uh, okay, I will come to that in a second. So, um, and what a lot of people don't know is that the burdock seeds are also used uh, medicinally. Uh, the burrs actually were the inspiration for uh, Velcro, so because of the way they stick to things. So, uh, this plant, of course, is one that we have in Nature Sunshine. And it's actually a very nutritious plant. It's one of those herbs that, that actually, you know, we're taking it in capsules or people are taking it in extracts or whatever, but it's actually a food plant. Native Americans ate it. It's still used in Asian cuisine. So it's actually an edible medicinal plant. In other words, you can eat it as a food and get the medicinal qualities out of it as a food, just like you can eat garlic as a food. Um, and garlic is also a medicine. So the roots contain a lot of inulin, which is a fructooligosaccharide, uh, a type of polygo, uh, polysaccharide that's made with fructose molecules. And inulin cannot be digested by the human enzyme system, but it is, uh, like other fructooligosaccharides, a really good food for gut bacteria. So a lot of plants in the Asteraceae or sunflower family contain inulin. Chicory root does. There's a little bit in dandelion. There's quite a bit in burdock. There's some in L. campaign. Um, and uh, Jerusalem artichokes, if any of you are familiar with those, are also called sunchokes. So these foods actually have been traditionally used to improve the health of the, of the intestinal tract because they feed the friendly bacteria in the gut. Now that also means they can kind of uh, tend to produce a little bit of gas or bloating if you eat a lot of them, particularly if you eat them raw. When you cook them, some of the inulin gets kind of converted to uh, the simpler sugars, which makes them uh, easier to digest. Anyway, um, 
Burdock root is a little bit bitter, so it stimulates bile flow and AIDS digestion. I dug up a first year root once and tried to eat it, and I was like, I didn't know how people could eat something that bitter. Um, I think now I probably would have a little more tolerance for something that had a more bitter flavor. There's antimicrobial properties and antifungal properties in burdock root, and it also contains compounds that inhibit tumors, which is why burdock is often include, included in anti-cancer remedies. But, it's a, but again, it's a very safe and gentle food herb, something that anybody can take. But if you actually see the plant, there's a couple of things that you can get the benefit of the plant that you wouldn't um, you know, just from, you know, getting the burdock in, in the capsules, you know, commercially. First of all, the leaves can be crushed up and make a great poultice as they've been applied to, to burns, to, to uh, other injuries in order to be able to help speed healing. So the burdock leaves are like great big band-aids. Think of them that way that you can, you know, uh, if you've got some injuries, you can kind of crush them a little bit to release some of the juices and lay them over injured the bodies. The, the seeds are also tinctured and used as an herbal remedy. Uh, the seeds are used more for kind of an acute uh, condition. Uh, they're, they're a little more acute for acute uh, infection, uh, whereas the root is more for you know, helping uh, more chronic uh, problems. Um, now, someone just mentioned that um, they have a plant uh, in their yard that looks similar but it has milky uh, uh, like liquid in the leaves. And burdock does not have uh, milky sap. So if, if the plant has milky sap, it isn't burdock. The, the best thing to do to learn to identify these things is to basically you know, keep your eyes open of, of things growing around you. You know, look at plants and, and you, it's easier to identify what burdock is in its second year. So if you see the plant growing in a certain place in the first year, and then you go back in the se second year and you see that it shoots up with the burdock flowers and, and the burdock you know, seeds and all that kind of stuff, then you've identified it, and then you know what the plant actually looks like in its first year, which enables you to like, know how to harvest it um, safely. Uh, I don't know what the plant is that you're looking at that has uh, milky sap because I'd actually have to see probably the flowers. And even then, I don't know all the plants all over the country. Chickweed is another uh, uh, common little weed that will grow in people's lawns and, you know, in kind of fields and waste places and everything. Um, it grows on roadsides, it grows underneath trees. You can see the little flower and the other thing has five sepals and five petals that split in the middle. So I'm just going to come back here. You see, um, if I pull out my little uh, highlighter, okay, this is one petal right here. And one of the characteristics of the chickweed to look for is that it has this deep lobe. So it looks like it has twice as many petals as it does because the petals all have this deep lobe. So that's one of the characteristics of, of looking at this plant um, when it's in flower. Also, um, there are other members of this genus, uh, but this one can be distinguished by the fact that the hairs are only a single band on one side of the stem, whereas other uh, members of this um, family have hairs covering the entire stem. So chickweed is, gets, it gets its name because it's been used as a chicken feed. Now, having raised chickens, I know that there are a lot of greens that chickens like to munch on. Um, and I know that when I had chickens, there were a lot of weeds I would pull up in my garden and I'd throw them in the chicken coop and the chickens would go crazy over them. And it gets the name chickweed because chickens really like this plant. So it's a, it's a very tasty little vegetable. Uh, and it has a demulcent diuretic. It's very gently laxative and anti-inflammatory. But the crushed leaves have been applied to injuries to help them to uh, heal. And of course, we do have chickweed available in capsules in Nature Sunshine. And the, one of the primary things we use it for is that it helps in metabolizing fats. So we use it to help relieve fatty congestion in the liver, to aid in weight loss, and also to help dissolve fatty tumors in people. But one of the lesser known uses is that chickweed applied topically, especially the fresh leaves or a preparation made from the fresh leaves, are one of the best remedies for itching. 
And my kind of take on that is years ago, a, a chiropractic, uh, uh, the chiropractor I went to see, who was kind of a mentor of mine. Uh, he had worked with Dr. Bernard Jensen and had been around for a long time. He he explained to me that, you know, you have oil ducts in the skin and you have sweat glands in the skin. And when the the skin is trying to eliminate some uh, fatty soluble toxin, that that fatty soluble toxin can get stuck in the thin layer of fat under the skin and not be able to, to move up to the surface and that'll make you itch. And since, again, chickweed seems to have this property of helping the body break down fats, it probably helps the body kind of break apart those fatty substances so that they can be dispersed and eliminated. At least that's my theory based on uh, what um, he said. But Now, who doesn't know what a dandelion is? Okay, if you don't know what a dandelion is, I, I wonder what, which planet you've been on for a while, because this little plant, which is actually a native of Eurasia, of uh, Europe and Asia, which came over here to America with the first white people, basically is spread all over North America and grows just about everywhere and uh, produces those little characteristic seed pods and those very bright sunny flowers, and it's in the Asteraceae or, or sunflower family. The the one of the ways of identifying the dandelion is that it has large jagged teeth that point slightly backwards on the leaf and the name dandelion actually comes from uh, the French dent to lion which means teeth of the lion so basically the the dandelion is short for lion's teeth or for, kind of French for lion's teeth this one ha does have a milky, bitter sap, um, and uh, the flowers have the strap-shaped petals that you'll see. The petals actually aren't petals. They're individual flowers called ray flowers. And so it, if you actually went back and uh, let me go back and uh, when you when you are looking at the dandelion here, as is characteristic of all members of the uh, Asteraceae family, each one of these little things that we think of as a petal is actually a separate flower. So this is actually an inflorescence. It's a head of many, many, many tiny flowers. And each one of the flowers produces one seed. So this seed head shows you how many flowers there were. I mean, every one of those little seeds comes from a separate flower. Um, so there aren't really petals. They're, they're actually um, uh, individual flowers that have kind of a strap-like nature. How come my slides aren't advancing? Let's try that again. There we go. Anyway, so these are growing in, the, in people's yards. Um, dandelions are very nutritious. Um, we they're also very medicinal. And when I I you know got into natural healing and I I learned how to do muscle testing and isolate primary weaknesses, I found that very often the Stomach, liver, and kidneys were the three primary organs that were the weakest in most people. Uh, that's kind of shifted a little bit because I find that um, now the thyroid and adrenals uh, often rival those uh, in terms of weakness because people are so stressed and burned out and everything. But the dandelions are a good remedy for all three of those organs. They help uh, as a tonic to the digestion. They act as a cholagogue to help improve liver detoxification. The root is particularly good for the liver detoxification. And then the leaf is really good as a mild diuretic for the kidneys. It's very high in potassium, and so it makes a very good uh, non, what's called a non-irritating diuretic. There are some diuretics that work by basically kind of slightly irritating the kidney to produce more urine. And then there are other diuretics that work because they supply kind of nutrition that actually help gives the kidneys what they need to work more efficiently. And dandelion leaf really helps the ki kidney work more efficiently. Now, we, in Nature Sunshine, we don't carry the leaf. We only carry the root. Um, so uh, mostly what the Nature Sunshine dandelion uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, going, is going to be working primarily on the liver and somewhat on the stomach. Someone just said that they can't get dandelion shipped to California anymore, and all that has to do with Prop 60, is it 64 or 65? 
about the, the cancer-causing chemicals. Uh, these companies go after companies on that whole thing, and the amounts of certain heavy metals they have are so ridiculously low that nothing in your supermarket could qualify uh, as not being carcinogenic. But because the herbs are not considered exempt like foods are, Nature Sunshine has having you know problems where they have to like you know uh, they can't uh, sell some of the herbs if they've got too much of certain min uh, metals in them or whatever. That's where that problem comes from. Anyway, um, I've tasted dandelion wine. It's kind of interesting. I read years ago a recipe for how to make it, and you'd have to be like really, really, really dedicated to make it because the the, the recipe called for thirty quarts. 30 quarts, can you imagine getting 30 quarts of dandelion flowers? And then you have to pick all the green off of them so that there's no green on the bottom of the flower and only the, the yellow parts of the flower, and then that's used to make wine. And uh, roasted dandelion root and roasted chicory root, um, which is uh, another member of the Astraceae family, um, have both been used to make a, a coffee substitute, and you'll actually find both of them in a lot of these uh, uh, natural coffee alternatives, um, like uh, Nature Sunshine. I don't know if Nature. I don't remember which plants are in the uh, herbal beverage Nature Sunshine cells, but if you look at the ingredients in that one and other things, it's usually it'll contain uh, roasted grains like barley and then uh, dandelion or chicory or something like that as a as a coffee substitute. So anyway, a really useful plant. Um, you can pick the, the leaves and roots of the mature plants through the spring and the fall. Um, the leaves are more bitter in the spring. They kind of mellow a little bit through the summer. Uh, but one of the things that dandelion is, because one of the first plants to kind of come up in the spring, it's one of those plants that people have used as a spring tonic, basically to kind of clean out the body uh, after the, the winter. You can wash the leaves. Uh, you can put a little bit of them in salads. I would taste them first. A lot of them are just really too bitter to eat. Um, and if you uh, dig up the roots, you can wash them uh, uh, and uh, dry them uh, it, for use as a coffee substitute. But basically, uh, you're going to want to roast them. They contain that inulin, and that roasting or cooking again you know, releases some of that inulin and breaks it down to, be, to into fructose that actually can be assimilated, which gives them a little sweeter taste. Um, now, this is a really interesting little plant. I, I really like this little one. I have this one growing in my uh, yard. It's called uh, dead nettle or henbit. Uh, Lamium and plexical is the particular species here, and and you get you can kind of see the name hen bit if you think of okay here's kind of like the 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 chicken head in the flower, and this is the beak of the the chicken right here, and then this is the little comb on top of the head, so it's like the little chicken thing, um, and then you can kind of see the leaves underneath it that are they have kind of a characteristic. There's another picture on the next. No, I guess I didn't get another picture of this. Um, anyway, so it's a low-growing annual plant. Uh, it's a member of the mint family, and you can tell members of the mint family because they have square stems with um, opposite leaves that alternate up the stem. So going back to this, um, basically we can't see the stem here, but there's one set of leaves coming off this way, and an opposite leaf coming off that way, and then the next pair of leaves comes off this way at right angles to the first, and then the next one comes off at right angles again. So that's that plus a square stem is an identifying characteristic of, of plants in the mint family. So um, anyway, so the flowers are very small; they're kind of pink to purplish, and uh, obviously, you get there. Oh, here's here here you can see the picture. So, so you can see the the leaves kind of again coming off on opposite sides, alternating up the stem. So, so you see that uh, this pair of leaves is coming running this direction. This pair of leaves is running that direction. The next pair of leaves runs that direction, 
and the stem, if you were able to see it a little better, you'd notice it was kind of square. And there you can again even see kind of the from the side, kind of the whole like little hen pecking uh, thing. How from the side it looks sort of like a uh, this looks kind of like the beak, <laughs> you know, and the eye and the little comb on top of the chicken's head. Okay, so um, this is a tasty little green. This, there, there are there are some plants that I are edible, uh, but not all plants that are edible are palatable, meaning are pleasant to eat. And this one is actually quite pleasant to eat. Uh, it's got a little bit of tannin, so it's a little bit of a mild astringent. Um, but you know, it's also got some mucilage in it, it's, so it's kind of soft, and it tastes pretty good. So it's a nice one to toss into a salad and um, give you a little extra nutrition with it. So, um, docks or other things, again, docks aren't likely growing in your lawn and they aren't likely growing in your garden, but they are often going to grow kind of roadsides or uh, what they call waste places, vacant lots, the edges of fields, um, stuff like that. And what you're seeing here is a picture of dock flowers, which don't look very showy and are kind of what are, what are called inconspicuous because people wouldn't think of them as flowers to look at them. So they're a little tiny and usually kind of green or a little bit red. There's a lot of different species of docks, um, a whole bunch of them. As far as I know, all of them can be used. Um, yellow dock is the one that we use in Nature Sunshine. It's the standard species, Rumix crispus. It has, it's, it's the name crispus has to do with the fact that the the leaves are curled, which is why it's also called curly dock. Um, sheep sorrel is also a dock, same genus, Rumix. Uh, and then there's a number of other ones. But the docks um, uh, are, are identified, uh, they're, they're very erect plants. If you look at closely on the stem, there's these little knobby swollen joints or knobs on the stem. That's a thing that helps you identify them. And there's a basal rosette. That's a, a series of leaves growing right out of the root at the base of the plant. And another characteristic is look for these plants in the fall, which helps you identify them, because they turn rust colored. A lot of them turn rust colored as they age in the fall. So you'll see the dried plants standing out in the field and they'll, they'll, they'll be these like dried out rusty colored, you know, erect plants with those kind of uh, the, the flowers, of course, turn into little seed uh, pods, and that's what's happening here is this one has already bloomed and it's starting to develop into little seeds at the top, and basically um, that's to identify them. Um, the, the roots are the parts that are, are commonly used um, for in herbal medicine, so, you know, the yellow dock root is what we sell, and it's used... Uh, to help with iron levels, uh, helps overcome anemia, it helps to kind of purify the blood, it's a little bit of anti-infective, it's used to clear up skin conditions, but the leaves, uh, especially the very young tender leaves of the docks, are edible. They contain, um, they're slightly sour, um, sheep sorrel is probably one of the more pleasant tasting of them, and the one that's the, the most uh, palatable. I, I planted a sheep sorrel in my yard and it grew for one year and then it kind of died um, out. It, it, um, I mean, it actually grew for two years and then kind of died out. Um, a lot of these docks only live one year. But the, the leaves contain oxalic acid, which is also found in spinach and uh, there's a little bit of it in chard and it's in rhubarb and it gives that soury taste. And there's some evidence that, you know, excessive oxalic acid might be a problem, especially if you're sensitive to having kidney stones. But a little bit actually helps uh, as a cancer prevention. And a lot of herbs that have some oxalic have also been used as, as cancer treatments. Um, you, you can crush up the leaves and use them as a poultice. So uh, the plant's quite, you know, useful for a variety of, of reasons. This is another one I have growing in my lawn. It's called, I call it stork's bill because that's the first name I learned for it. It's more commonly called fillery uh, and it's also called heron, heron's bill. 
the species that grows around here is Erodium cicutarium, uh, although there's a couple other species like Erodium uh, malacoides, and it's in the geranium family. So if you look it, it closely at it, if you've ever grown geraniums, you'll see the similarity kind of in the flower. And um, one of the characteristics of geraniums is um, that um, right through the middle of this is, uh, thing in the center, you have these uh, stamens clustered around the pistil, which is the female part. So as the, as the um, uh, female part, as the ovary gets fertilized, the pistil, instead of falling off like it does in most plants, actually starts to grow and elongate and grows out of the flower into a tall, spiky thing. And so um, basically, we'll see that on the next slide. This is a picture I took of fillery growing in my um, lawn. I don't actually like have much of a lawn. It's more like a weed patch because the soil is so clay. But anyway, so here, you, here you see the little flower, right here, and here you see as the flower is matured, you see this long thing that was the female reproductive part of the plant growing out, like a little needle, or that's where it gets the stork's bill or heron's bill name because of that long little pointy thing, and in um, in flower essence therapy, the, this plant is used for people who are nitpickers, <laughs> who fuss too much over details. But anyway, you, you've got the miniature geranium-like flowers. The, the leaves are very finely divided, like yarrow leaves, um, kind of a little bit lacy. Um, and uh, so when I, later on I show you pictures of yarrow leaves, you'll, you'll get kind of the idea of what uh, I'm talking about. I, I don't really have a good picture of the leaf. I'm trying to increase my uh, photograph, uh, my collection of photographs of plants. Um, anyway, so the young leaves are edible. Uh, when it first comes up in the spring, it's actually very tasty. Um, as it matures and goes to flower and then to seed, um, it becomes more astringent. So, um, meaning it gets more tannins. So. When it's first in the spring, I like to pick it and munch on it. Um, when it uh, gets a little older, um, it's, it's not so nice. I've never eaten the root, but the roots are also edible. Um, and of course, if you gathered some of the mature leaves or the mature you know, roots, um, it would make a mild astringent and a little bit of a diuretic. And uh, both the root and the leaves have been used as a tea to help uh, after a woman's given birth to, you know, stop the postpartum bleeding and basically help with the healing. So um, it's a useful little plant. Like I say, I've got it, you know, in my yard and so forth. This is another plant uh, that actually um, I've seen some of it growing in my garden. This one doesn't tend to grow in the lawn. It tends to grow more in the garden, especially when there's a little more, like uh, if you get soil and get you know a little more manure in it, get a little higher nitrogen content. Um, the plants in the Ch Chinopodi AC uh, like a little higher nitrogen content in the in the um, in to grow. Uh, the Chinopodi AC is the family that beets are in, um, and Swiss chard. So this plant is related to beets and Swiss chard. And this uh, is in, uh, is, th there's kind of some change that some botanists have actually reclassified this as an amaranthus, which basically is, we're going to talk about later, amaranth. So it's actually kind of related to quinoa um, and amaranth. Uh, but it's also called lamb's quarter, lamb, it's called gooseput, lamb's quarters, pigweed, um, et cetera. So this is what the plant looks like when it's young. And so you'll, you'll a lot of times see this like growing up in people's gardens is this little, little plant. And at this stage where it looks just like this, it's really a very nice, tasty uh, green. Uh, you could just pick it and eat it in salads or you could cook it like spinach. Um, it, uh, you can steam it. It's got, it like spinach, it's got oxalic acid, um, so you don't want to eat too much of it. Um, 
And the plants produce lots of seeds, so they go to seed quite readily. And quinoa is actually a uh, closely related species, which is the grain. The grain quinoa comes from another species in this same uh, genus. So um, anyway, so when you're eating uh, quinoa, you're eating the seeds of uh, one of the members of this uh, genus. Uh, you could actually eat the seeds of this one too, uh, but the reason the, the, other, the other species is used is because the seeds are easier to gather. This is another one that grows in my garden. It didn't used to grow in my garden, and then as I improved the soil composition of my soil and got it richer and got some more sand in it because I have a heavy clay soil, um, these started to pop up. Dif different weeds grow in different soil conditions, and so I actually have a book that I got from Acres USA about weeds that basically um, you look up the weeds that you've got growing, and it tells you what minerals are lacking in your soil and what the problems are with your soil based on what weeds are growing there, so you can go know what kind of nutrients to add. So when I uh, first got the book, uh, the, the prominent weeds I had were the gypsum weed or detura with the morning glories, etc. I didn't really have much of some of these other stuff. So I, I looked it up and the soil was low in organic matter. It, ha it was low in calcium and some other things. So I've added more organic matter. I've put more enzymes into the soil. I actually sprayed Nature's Fresh and, and I actually used a little bit of Nature's Fresh and Sunshine Concentrate in with the fertilizers I put in my garden. And then uh, also uh, low in calcium. And so adding calcium to my soil has really helped a lot. And now the, the, the weeds are changing. And so I need to go do a little more research as to what imbalances are now present in my soil based on the new weeds that are tending to grow in my soil. This is called um, cheesies or cheese weed or cheese plant or, or a common mallow or garden mallow, malva neglecta. It's, it's related to marshmallow, which is a different genus, Althea um, officinalis, but uh, the malvas are the common mallows, and but they're very similar to the um, the thing. Oh, I, I I meant to before I went to this one. I wanted to uh, I wanted to point out the blossom. The the mallow blossoms uh, have this kind of like uh, all of the little um, what are called. Uh, stamens cluster around the pistil at the center of the plant, producing this kind of little spiky thing. You'll see this in a hollyhock. If any of you have hollyhocks in your garden or, or grown hollyhocks, it's like a miniature hollyhock flower. That's, a, that's what mallow flowers look like, is like a, a hollyhock-like configuration. Hibiscus is also in the mallow family. So that's another plant, if you're familiar with it, you can know what it looks like. Anyway, so what that does is as the flower dies, it produces this little um, seed right here. This is the seed still enclosed in the brackets. It hasn't matured because when it matures, it'll be dry. But at this stage, when it's still green, um, you, you peel back the little uh, brackets that are surrounding the little developing fruit and you eat it and it's yummy and they're called cheesy. So when my kids were little, I taught them that this was edible, and they would go pick them and eat them all the time. Um, they, they liked them so much. So it's a very, very pleasant tasting um, food, and that's where it gets its name, cheese eats, because it's like a little wheel of cheese. Anyway, so. Um, trying to get this to advance again. Having trouble, there it goes. Okay, now, so you can use common garden mallow for almost any purpose that you would use uh, marshmallow or althea root for. Um, you, it, it reduces inflammation, it reduces swelling, it reduces pain. Uh, the leaves, as well as the cheesies, are edible, and they're also quite pleasant tasting, if a little bit fuzzy. Um, the root is edible, but, uh, it's kind of like too chewy and stringy to be of any good. Uh, the leaves you could dry and make into a tea, or you could crush the fresh leaves and use as a poultice for skin irritations. 
Uh, the plant is very rich in calcium and iron and very helpful for soothing, uh, you know, irritation. Um, I took, uh, this spring I had a lot of mallows uh, that were out in my garden uh, that had, were left over because my garden kind of laid fallow last year and I had some mallows that got some pretty deep roots down. They're perennials, so they come up year after year once they're established and they had gone to seed and, and I had, I pulled up hundreds of baby mallows out of my, uh, my garden. But the big ones I dug up and I decided I didn't want to waste the roots. So I, I cut up, I chopped up the roots and I uh, added some astragalus tongue depressors. They're I to say that there are tongue depressors because because slices of astragalus root look like tongue depressors, and I and I threw them into a pot uh, with equal parts honey and equal parts water, and I was going to make a syrup out of them. Well, I let it simmer too long, and I wound up basically boiling all of the water out of the the extract, and I wound up with a, a astragalus. Uh, marshmallow root honey, which has actually made a very nice kind of immune tonic and uh, respiratory remedy. So it was kind of fun. Um, anyway, uh, so again, it's like this stuff, people dig it up out of the gardens and throw it away. And I sometimes have to dig it up and throw it away because I don't have time to do anything with it. But it's interesting to know that you have medicines, you know, that are growing as weeds in your garden. Mullen is another one that uh, you're not going to see so much in your garden, but it tends to grow like you see on the picture here, on roadsides, near vacant lots, in open fields, etc. Seeds itself really uh, quite readily. It's uh, um, notice the dried stalks of the previous year mullen that have kind of a, a rusty color, and then the new stalks with the yellow flowers on top. Uh, mullen is also a biennial, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing um, mullen plants that were that had grown up the previous year and died, and then you're seeing some of the second year mullen plants that are growing to flower. So the first year, uh, it has these you know soft, um, fuzzy leaves that grow in a the, what's called a basal rosette, just clo low to the ground. Uh, and then the second year, it sends up the stalk with the yellow flowers. And then after that, you know one of the ways that you find this plant. Uh, it'll find it before it sends up stocks. In other words, you want to locate it in early spring. You're driving along the road or whatever, and you see those those uh, stocks from the previous year left over. You can pretty be sure that they've seeded themselves, and there's going to be new uh, mullen plants growing uh, uh, where the old mullen plants were. So uh, that helps you find them. Find it. Um, so mullen leaves, of course, are traditionally used as respiratory remedy, and we use those for that purpose in Nature Sunshine. But what a lot of people don't know is that if you pick the flowers and stick them in olive oil and let them uh, macerate in the olive oil for two weeks, you just kind of want to shake it every day a little bit, and then extract it out, that actually makes a wonderful uh, remedy for earaches. It's very soothing to the ears, and a lot of there are a number of companies that make a garlic, mullen flour, and St. John's wort oil for earaches. Um, the root is, interestingly enough, used as a urinary tonic. I hosted an AHG webinar last night, and she talked about mullen root as a remedy for interstitial cystitis and for helping to tone up the bladder and urinary organs. And my friend Thomas Easley uses the root also for back problems. The big leaves have been applied Topically, like the burdock leaves, to help things heal and to reduce swelling and lymph nodes. And according to Matthew Wood, if you have a rib that gets kind of broken or moved out of place, if you tape a mullen leaf over that area, it will help the root, the the rib to move back into place, or and also to knit back together. So it's used for broken bones. And another use for it is uh, it's been used as a wilderness toilet paper. So um, you. I can figure out what that means. So the oxeye daisy is a, is a little daisy that you'll often see. It kind of like grows in people's lawns. It's a very, very low-growing daisy, especially since people mow their lawns, and so it gets mowed over. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually uh, related to chrysanthemums. Um, and uh, the leaves are dark on green on both sides, and then you have the white ray flowers and white disc flowers. And you can eat the leaves of this one. 
Uh, and the tea of the herb is a little bit diuretic and astringent, and it's been used as a vaginal douce. So uh, it's kind of like a, a, a little, another little free remedy that people often have growing in their yards. Um, now this is amaranth or pigweed, um, which, uh, okay, the chinopodium family is some of those, some of those are called pigweeds and some of these are called pigweeds. I, I think it's probably because a number of these plants, again, like nitrogen rich soil. So you get, um, you know, you, you have corrals where you have pigs or other animals and you have a lot of manure and probably you know, in some of the soil nearby, you're likely to get some of these weeds that really like nitrogen in the soil, high nitrogen in soil. Um, nettles is another plant that likes really high nitrogen, um, and nettles will often grow over where there's an old outhouse or something. Anyway, um, uh, so this is all called like red root pigweed because it again has a little, uh, I don't have a picture of the little young plant, but uh, it, it has kind of a similar look to the other uh, pigweed we looked at earlier, but it has a red root when you pull it up, and it forms a tumbleweed. And um, and uh, the I think there's one of the species here that's used to make quinoa, and I'm not sure whether it's it's that the there's some there's some they're they're doing some changing around in botany and reclassifying things or so forth. But if you've eaten amaranth seeds, they definitely come from this plant. So and it produces lots of little teeny seeds. So um, you can again eat the young greens. They're very high in calcium and protein. The seeds, of course, are edible because you can buy them in the store, and the plants are also a mild uh, internal and external astringent. This is another little plant I kind of like. Uh, it's in the uh, Asteraceae or sunflower family. So what you're uh, looking at is, again, a little head of a bunch of tiny little flowers that are produced in the head, and it has kind of those like fern-like fuzzy leaves, and it grows very low to the ground. I've seen this growing in sidewalks, cracks, and kind of like uh, vacant lots, etc. And it, it's called pineapple weed or wild chamomile. It smells very much like chamomile. Uh, a little bit sweeter perhaps than chamomile, and it can actually be used like chamomile. Chamomile has white ray flowers and yellow disc flowers like the daisies, but uh, the pineapple weed basically has yellow disc flowers, although you could kind of see the hint of white ray flowers around the base. Um, it's, it's, again, it's kind of easy. These are, a lot of these plants are really small. So most people just walk by them and they never see them because you, when you're looking at a blossom that's maybe a quarter of an inch across and not really showy or that you know big, most people aren't paying enough attention to actually see these things. I, since I got into looking at plants when I was a teenager, I actually am uh, seeing this stuff all the time because I'm always looking for teeny little flowers because to me they're like little little teeny jewels, finding little gems of things in the in the yard. I'm, revealing a lot about myself in, in talking about this kind of thing. Anyway, you can eat it uh, a little bit, uh, especially when it's young. Again, young plants uh, tend to be less bitter and a little sweeter and more palatable. Um, it's milder than chamomile, but can be used like a chamomile tea, which means it's a mild sedative, mild anti-inflammatory agent, or a remedy for colds and fevers, and has a little bit of a disinfectant quality too. Now, this is one of my favorite weeds, and I, okay, and again, I'm really, you know, revealing how weird I am when I say I've tried to get this weed to grow in my yard. Um, <laughs> I like plantain. Unfortunately, the soil conditions where I live are not very conducive to growing this particular plant, so um, it doesn't do well. When I was in northern Utah and a lot of places around the country, I see this thing this stuff growing everywhere. Now, now this is the Plantago lanceolata, lance like in lance-like, because the leaves are long and narrow. The Plantago major, which I have a picture of, has oval-shaped leaves that are fatter. But both of them have a, have a this basal rosette of leaves. You see how all the leaves are kind of like coming out of the ground? 
They're coming directly off of the root. And then the little spiky thing is the flower head. The little white things are the flowers that are blooming on the flower head. And they're very, very tiny little flowers. So I, 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 um, this is the broadleaf plantain, the plantago major. And one of the characteristics of this plant is that it has what are called parallel veins on the leaf. That means they're, they're veins that run like this, parallel. Now, most plants that have parallel veins are not what are called dicots, like this plant is, but they're monocots. But this one is not a monocot, but it also, because it also has little net veins that kind of connect the major veins. But the fact that it has these long veins that parallel each other is one of the ways that you identify this plant. And again, you have the two varieties, what I call the rattlesnake plantain, which is the, the narrow leaf uh, plantain. And then this is the, the broadleaf or common plantain. And so when I lived in um, Fairview, Utah, a neighbor of mine came over and um, had a kid who'd been stung by a, a bee and his arm was swelling up and he w was thinking he needed to take the kid to the, the hospital and but did I know anything that might work? Um, and I said, I, I walked out into my lawn and I grabbed a leaf of um, the broadleaf plantain. I crushed it up. I put it on the bee sting and I said, hold that there for, for 15 minutes. And if the swelling doesn't go down, take him to the hospital. Well, 15 minutes later, the swelling gone down. I learned that trick from reading Advanced Treatise in Herb Herbal Medicine by Edward Shook. And when I was over in uh, Russia, meeting my uh, recent ex-wife, um, we were wandering around this little town on the side of the beach, and I was wearing these sandals I had never worn before, and I got a little bit of a blister because they didn't quite fit right. And she says, oh, there's a plant around here that's going to like help you heal that. And then she says, oh, there it is, and it was plantain. And so she crushed up the plantain and stuck it on my, my foot. Um, her mom was an herbalist too. Anyway. But um, so I really like to know, I really like people to know this plant because this is one of the best plants for applying to insect bites and bee stings and minor injuries. It's a great first aid remedy. The leaves are edible. Uh, they have a pleasant sour taste and, and like, um, uh, what was the other, like the mallow, they reduce intestinal inflammation. So they help the gut to heal, uh, which is why this is one of the ingredients in um, intestinal soothe and build. But the fresh leaves are really, really good for this, and uh, and the the dried leaves are not near as good as the fresh leaves in this particular plant. Um, in fact, uh, the the best way to use it for this thing is actually to go pick the fresh leaves and basically uh, put them in the blender with some vodka, some high proof alcohol, and whir them up and let it sit for a couple of days and then strain it out and then make a, a what's called a fresh plant tincture. Uh, as an interesting note, the seeds of this plant are mucilaginous and what we call psyllium comes from Plantago psyllium, which is a species in India. And um, that particular species is reported to be used by the mongoose uh, to treat himself from poisonous cobra bites. This is a plant that is growing in my yard that I do not like. Um, it's called puncture vine, caltrop, uh, uh, devil's weed, tackweed, uh, tribulus, tribulus terristus. It's it's a okay. It's it's an evil little plant. I I hate to call any plant evil, but having stepped on the seeds of these several times and ha having them have jabbed me in the feet, I consider this an evil plant. So. Um, You'll you'll know you'll know you found this plant if you step on one of these seeds. The the there was actually okay. My my son, uh, I knew it was I knew it was called puncture vine or tribulus, and I I I it was outgrowing in the yard. And we have a policy that you have to take your shoes off coming into the house because when you let people wear their shoes, sometimes they get these in the bottom of their shoes and then track them into the carpet and then you're walking around in the carpet barefoot and you step on one and, and it hurts like crazy. But if you if you get one of the punctured by one of these you know because they really hurt. So this plant grows kind of a radiates out growing along the ground to make a patch. 
that can be up to like one to three feet around if you let the plant just keep growing. And then it produces in that little patch these little teeny seeds that you can see forming here that have these spikes on them. And the spikes happen to be arranged at just the angles that when, wherever it falls on the ground, one of the spikes is going to be standing up. And um, so my son called this caltrop plant. And I asked him why, and he said, well, the caltrop is this little uh, device that they used in the Middle Ages that had the spikes that would have one spike sticking straight up no matter how you tossed them out on the ground. And they would throw them on the ground so that as the cavalry w was charging across the ground, the horses would step on the spikes and it would impale their feet and they would fall over and it would uh, use as a cavalry weapon. Well, I didn't know until I looked it up in the book that this one of the names for this is caltrop plant and that the caltrop was actually invented probably from the seeds of this plant was the inspiration for this very cruel uh, weapon. Uh, what it's the, the pinnately compound leaves, which I think actually are, are show up better in the previous picture. Go back to the previous picture for a second. You can see the, the leaf with a lot of little teeny leaflets on it um, that kind of, uh, uh, that's another thing to look for with this plant. Um, anyway, but the seeds and the little teeny yellow flowers, it's, it's hard to miss. It's, you, if you have it in your yard, you'll know that they puncture bicycle tires too. Um, so if your kids have bicycles and they ride over them, they'll wind up with flats, which happened to me when I was growing up in Salt Lake too. Now, you can eat this, uh, but, it, but it's kind of medicinal, so I would only use it as an emergency food. It lowers cholesterol a little bit, lowers blood pressure a little bit, has a little bit of cardiac tonic effect. It's been used to dissolve uric acid and aid kidney function. Um, and it also has a modest testosterone enhancing action in men. So I think, you know, maybe even stepping on the seeds enhances my testosterone because it puts me in a fighting mood. Uh, anyway, um, but uh, Michael Moore, who talks about it this, this in one of his books, he says you should definitely, if you've got this in your yard, gather it up dry it out and use it to make tea to help, you know, your kidneys and your whatever. And because ev every time you pick this plant, it's one st small step forward for mammal kind. Uh, and you're avoiding people having, uh, being punctured. <laughs> okay, so this particular plant is purslane. And uh, this one I actually have tried to plant in my garden. Again, you know, I had someone who came over and I showed him my garden in you know, I had like nettle, stinging nettle in my garden. And he says, I've never known anyone, he says, who deliberately is cultivating weeds. And I go, well, okay, I'm an herbalist. So I actually happen to like a lot of weeds. So this one, which, which again, doesn't grow very well here because I guess the soil isn't rich enough or something or there's enough moisture. It's a little succulent plant. The, the, the leaves are succulent or juicy. And it's also been called pigweed, I guess. I, again, probably because it would tend to grow where there's more nitrogen in the soil. But anyway, it's yummy. It's one of the tastiest little wild vegetables. Whenever I find this one, I munch down on the leaves. They're, they're, they're really yummy. I would gladly add them to salad. This is a close-up. You can see the little yellow flower. You can see the kind of the succulent leaves. It tends to grow in areas with a good amount of moisture and a lot of sunlight. I got a lot of sunlight. I just don't have a lot of moisture. I'm in a desert. Anyway, whole plant's edible. It's got omega-3s in it. It's got antioxidants in it. It's got a little bit of that oxalic acid that gives it a cooling flavor. This is actually found uh, in the uh, VSC formula, one of the, what's well, one of the ingredients in that formula. And it's basically acting as a kind of a cooling, uh, immune-enhancing remedy, uh, but it's edible. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just edible, it's palatable. Um, and, and very delicious. I actually got seeds for it and threw it out there, but it, they didn't grow for some reason. So red clover, um, this is a little head of, of the clover blossoms, Trifolium pretense. Uh, it looks like a really gigantic white Dutch clover with red blossoms, with the clover-like, you know, three-part leaves. And you'll see this often growing in meadows and so forth. Um, like the black medic we looked at earlier, you can eat it, but again, can cause a little indigestion, although soaking it in salt water appears to help a little bit. Uh, of course, this is used as a blood purifier uh, and tea as an anti-cancer remedy. Um, 
as a remedy to clear up skin conditions. Makes a very nice tea. It's uh, got some phytoestrogens in it, so it actually helps to block excess estrogens in the body. Um, uh, all of my uncles uh, were painting contractors, except for one of them. Uh, my dad was a painting contractor too, and uh, a couple of my uncles developed some really bad neurological problems. Uh, one of them developed Parkinson's disease, and uh, I can't remember what the other one was, but um, they uh, probably, I think, from the paint fumes and stuff like that. My dad didn't because I got my dad working with herbs and taking stuff to protect his liver and everything. And one of my dad's younger brothers never developed those problems either. Um, but he uh, had been to an herbalist when he was young because he's seeing problems, and she encouraged him to drink red clover tea, which he drank just about every day. And I think it really helped to protect him against the toxicity of the paint. So that's a nice thing. This is another one of the little plants I really love. Um, this is salsify, also called oyster plant or goat's beard. And I memorized the Latin name for this one when I was a teen, Trogopagon dubius, and pro, tro, tro, Trogopagon parvifloris. Uh, you're looking at the parvifloris, which is a purple-flowered salsify, and then this is the dubious, Trogopagon dubious. You can see it kind of resembles a dandelion, um, has the ray flowers in the Asteraceae family. Um, the leaves of this one, though, are narrow and grass-like, and this one has a, has a milky sap. And uh, the seed heads look like a dandelion seed head, but they're much, much bigger. So that's one of the ways that you can kind of identify this plant is by its seed head. So here you have the seed head, this giant dandelion-like seed head um, coming out of that flower. Uh, and it, again, it has this kind of like strap-like um, leaves. So uh, this plant, I believe, is biennial. Um, so if you, if you harvest it in the first year, um, the root is edible. And it actually is cultivated as a vegetable uh, in Europe. Um, the roots are also called oyster plant because it's reported to have an oyster-like flavor. When I was young, I found some nice first-year salsify plants growing, and I dug them up and cooked them, and I really didn't like them that much. I thought they were, again, uh, way too bitter. Maybe I should try it again now that I'm older. I do have some of these that are growing wild in my yard. This is one that you'll see only in the very early spring. It's called Shepherd's Purse, Capsella Bursa Pastorius. It has these little white flowers and kind of these scraggly little uh, uh, stems that have little seed pods on them. And the identifying characteristic is these little white flowers with the four sepals and four petals, which is characteristic of the mustard family. And then it's these little seed pods that give it away. They look kind of like a little heart, um, but you know they're they're thought to you know by the people who named this plant to look like a purse. So that's where it gets its name, shepherd's purse. And I have eaten these little seed pods in this state when they're green. In fact, I've eaten the whole flowering top like this when it's green. It's very yummy. It's got kind of a peppery mustard taste because it's in the the uh, mustard family, uh, which used to be called Cruciferaceae, and now is called Brassicaceae. And but it, that's where you get cruciferous vegetables. And that whole family is a sulfur-loving family, which gives it kind of that mustardy um, flavor. So the whole plant can be eaten. Um, one of my um, interesting stories of playing with this stuff as a teenager is we had a huge field of this stuff and with the seeds being dry. And we actually gathered all the seeds and winnowed them, and we got nearly a cup of them. It, would, it took us like an hour's worth of work to get a cup of these seeds. And then we were carrying them over. We were going to cook them, and I, clumsy-fingered me, dropped the jar in the gutter and broke it, <laughs> ruining my and two of my friends' hours worth of work of gathering these seeds. And I felt so bad that I, uh, I was 
raised in a family where you didn't swear, but I thought it was appropriate to my friends to use the F word, so I said, you know what. Um, anyway, the seeds, the seed, the, I have eaten just a few seeds, but it would have been interesting to cook up, cook up a whole bunch of them. I've never tried that again. It was an awful lot of work for a very small amount of food, um, which is something that is true for a lot of wild foods, which explains why hunter-gatherers were never fat. You, you, you had to go work to get your calories, and therefore you were never likely to get fat because you, you actually had to go do physical labor to eat. Uh, the seeds are reported to mis kill mosquito larvae in water. The plant is used medicinally as an astringent and a vasoconstrictor to stop bleeding. So one of the its common uses is to stop uh, postpartum bleeding or mid-cycle bleeding in women. And also, because it's a vasodilator, it helps uh, to raise low blood pressure. And this next plant also helps to raise low pressure, pressure which is stinging nettle. And I, I think if you've ever touched stinging nettle, you rapidly figure out what it is because it has these little hairs on the leaves and the stem that in, like, act like little hypodermic needles to inject you with histamine and formic acid and acetylcholine and several other neurotransmitters that basically produce this nasty, stingy uh, sensation. Uh, formic acid, by the way, is what is in an ant bite, and histamine is part of the inflammatory reaction that causes you know, hay fever and uh, rhinitis and so forth. Anyway. Um, but uh, you look for the hairy leaves and the, and the stems, and what you're seeing is the little blossoms which develop into the seeds. Again, very inconspicuous blossoms. Um, this was the first plant I ever ate. Uh, we were on a camping trip, and somebody got into the plant and got stung by it, so we, I knew I had a positive identification, <laughs> and so I got something, you know, it's best to like harvest this plant with gloves. I got something so we could pick it. I boiled it in uh, two changes of water. I've since learned boiling it in, you know, once in one change of water is fine because as soon as you cook it, you neutralize the sting. When you dry it, you neutralize the sting too. But um, this is, um, I ate it. It was, it was yummy. I mean, it, to me, it tasted better than beet greens, which I happen to like. Um, it tastes, I think it tastes better than Swiss chard or spinach, too. Uh, I actually used, ate it just like that with just a little lemon juice on it. It was really good. And that actually was after eating that that I had my first uh, epiphany about uh, that God had put remedies for all our diseases growing naturally on the face of the earth, and kind of the whole experience propelled me into being an herbalist. So um, I kind of have an affinity for this plant as well as the last one we're going to talk about, yarrow which was the first herb I ever identified. Anyway, uh, the leaves can be dried for teas. Um, this is one of the most nutritious plants on the planet. It's high in uh, protein. It's high in iron. It's high in a lot of different vitamins. It's high in calcium. Um, it is used as a tonic to bring up anemia. The root is used for prostate problems. The seeds are used to halt progressive renal failure. The leaves are used also as a tonic to strengthen the kidneys as a as again a, a, a non-stimulating uh, or nourishing diuretic. It helps tissues to heal. I use it in pregnancy teas to help pregnant women. Uh, it can bring up low blood pressure and help with fatigue. So it's a very, very useful plant. Um, you'll see the teasels growing along the, the sides of the road. I, I, I don't, they aren't down here again in the desert area where I live, but I go, when I go up to northern Utah, or a lot of times when I've been traveling back east, driving along the road, I'll see these growing on the kind of the ditch banks or, or on the edges of fields and so forth. Um, so they're, they're pretty easy to spot, um, especially if you just look for these heads. Again, looking for the dried last year's plants helps you identify where the, the uh, the new plants will be because these are the seed heads, so they basically release seeds that are going to plant new new plants. Um, and so this, this is a very, very characteristic flower head. Um, the teasel root is used in TCM. Um, I don't know all of the uses for it, but one use I do know is that the root is used to help relieve uh, pain and symptoms from Lyme's disease. And the spiky flower heads were used as a comb in textiles, and basically that's where uh, a process called teasing the cloth, 
which is where the name teasel comes from. Thistles are also edible. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different species and genuses. The, the ones that are the most edible are the Circium Cer genus, but the uh, Sinecus, which is the blessed thistle, and the Silverberry milk, milk thistle also have, uh, can be eaten. My, my dad taught me, you know, when he was young, he, he, he'd peel the, the celery, he'd peel the thistle stalks, and eat the stem like celery. Um, some of them that I've tried are pretty tasty. Others are kind of pithy or bitter. Uh, I've also tried eating the roots. They had a kind of an artichoke-like taste. Um, but basically, if you if you cut the, the the stock down while it's still kind of succulent and juicy, you uh, basically very carefully. Uh, ideally with gloves on, peel off the leaves and the spines because you don't want to be eating those. They'd stick in your tongue and that's not pleasant. I know that because one time I was trying to peel a cactus pad and eat it and I accidentally got some of the little spines on my knife so it got into the flesh of the cactus and I got a couple of them in my tongue. And it's not a pleasant thing to do so just, you know, just be warned. Anyway, uh, some of them I've chewed on like celery and the first year roots, again, this is a biennial, uh, could be dug up and eaten. And uh, the leaves and the seeds are used as a bitter tonic to stimulate liver function, which is where we get blessed thistle and, of course, the milk thistle. This one is growing all over. This one is another weed that like is common in my yard and in my garden. And I have gathered it and used it. It's uh, it's wild lettuce. It's in the same genus as lettuce lettuce. Uh, lettuce you buy at the supermarket. It's also called prickly lettuce. Um, basically it has dandelion like leaves. You, you can see them right there. They look very much like the leaves of dandelion, but dandelions stay low to the ground and these send up spikes. The flowers look like dandelion flowers too as you can see, only they're very much smaller, about a quarter of the size. And of course they're again growing up on a stem. And it produces very tiny little dandelion-like seed heads, uh, very easy to spot. It's got milky sap, which is actually where most of the medicinal quality is in its milky sap. And it looks very scraggly and kind of unkempt. Uh, Matthew Wood calls dandelion the herbal street person because it likes to grow in waste places and vacant lots and looks unkempt. Um, the characteristic that makes this plant really easy to identify, and I don't have a picture of this, but on the underside of the leaf, okay, you see this vein that's that I've highlighted here that's running down. If you flip the leaf over and um, and look at the underside of that vein, there will be a row of little spiky hairs growing out of that vein that basically are kind of a little uh, brown color. And that is basically, you see the dandelion-like leaf and you see that spike, you've got the plant, it's nailed, you're looking at wild lettuce. Um, because it's related to lettuce, if you get the really, really t tiny, tender leaves, they're going to be uh, edible and used, used like a salad. Um, if you let lettuce, if like you grow lettuce in your garden and you let it bolt, where it starts to send up a shoot to, to produce flowers, which by the way are going to look a lot like this plant's flowers because they're very closely related, um, then it gets bitter. The lettuce gets bitter. So once it starts sending up the spike, it, it's, the leaves are basically too bitter to eat. The milky sap has a mild analgesic effect. The problem is it, it loses it when it's dried. So um, I've whizzed the fresh leaves in the blender with some alcohol to make a tincture of it, or you can just actually uh, take a little bit of the fresh um, sap and eat it, but it's nastily bitter, but it definitely has a mild sedative and analgesic effect. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Um, this is wood sorrel, which looks on the leaf structure, in other words, if you, you see this also growing in lawns, it has a very similar leaf to the black medic or the clovers, again, this trifoliate leaf, but the blossom is completely different. It's this little yellow blossom. This is all called so-called shamrocks, so, um, uh, or uh, oxalis, 
um, or sour plant, wood sorrel. Okay, so it grows in meadows, woodlands, and lawns. Uh, the leaves curl up at night and then open during the day to produce photosynthesis. The flowers are bright yellow, and they don't look clover-like, but the leaves look clover-like, which is how you identify this one. The leaves can be used sparingly in salads. Again, they have that soury kind of cooling taste, which, by the way, is kind of refreshing in summer when these plants are out there and growing in your yard, and it's kind of hot and whatever. I just sent out a nature's field talking about cooling, you know, using cooling remedies. Well, a lot of the plants we've talked about have this cooling sensation, kind of refreshing, taking down the heat a little bit. Um, a number of species have edible tuberous roots, and because it's a teeny bit of astringent, it's been used topically as a, as a skin wash. Um, and the last plant we're going to talk about is the first plant I learned to identify, the first plant I tried using as an herbal medicine, and the first plant I used as a flower essence, and it's called yarrow. Um, yarrow uh, has also been called noseweed plant and a lot of other names. It has very fern-like leaves, and remember I mentioned that uh, the leaves of the storksbill have this similar kind of fern-like appearance. Um, you see yarrow actually growing uh, both in people's gardens as a cultivated plant. I have it growing as a cultivated plant in my garden. It sometimes grows in people's lawns, um, and uh, it, that therefore it becomes considered a weed. Uh, the blossoms can be white. That's the most commonly used kind medicinally, but there are also yarrows that have yellow blossoms, pink, rose, lavender blossoms, and I've planted a couple of different colors in my yard because uh, I really like yarrows. Here's a yarrow that has a, a colored blossom. Yarrow is an astringent. I have used, I've actually picked fresh leaves and applied them to a bleeding cut to stop the bleeding. They're very effective at, at helping to stop bleeding. Um, you gather the flowers and dry them to make a tea for fevers. Um, and what's interesting is when I first was reading about yarrow in my teens, I read that the Native Americans chewed yarrow to relieve toothache. Well, here's where the, you know, a lot of the herb books have information in them that, you know, I mean, I, I'm guilty of it too, that you copy from other herb books, you know, that, uh, that you know, passes on kind of information. But a lot of times you lose some of the original way the herb was gathered or prepared or whatever to be used in that way. So I, I learned from Matthew Wood that if you, um, the young leaves before it sends up a flower stalk in the spring, uh, that are growing right out of the ground, if you pull them out, there's a purple tip on the end of the leaf. And if you chew on that, it's like chewing on a clove bud. It contains a, a, a topical anodyne that basically has a numbing effect. That's the part that was chewed to relieve toothache. Mature leaves or any other part is not going to have the effect. It's only that little part that has the little purple thing. So fascinating stuff to basically, you know, learn. So we've reached the end of our presentation. I, um, I've kind of enjoyed uh, uh, sharing my experiences with uh, using some of these plants and, uh, and how you identify them, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed that. Let's take a, a few um, questions. Uh, someone asked, what part of hibiscus do you uh, eat? Uh, and I, I not used to, you know, harvesting hibiscus. So there may be more than, you know, one species or whatever, but typically the part of hibiscus that's used to make a tea, um, it's not highly medicinal. It's mostly used like to flavor teas, is the flowers. It's hibiscus flowers. So I'd be sure to look up, you know, in a book and, and make sure that you've got species that could be used that way. But, um, you know, it is the flower that is the part that's used. Is it, someone asked, is it true that wild lettuce is good for sleep? Um, wild lettuce has a mild sedative effect, uh, which can help with sleep. However, um, the big problem is, is that once the herb is dried, it's fairly inert. It just doesn't have a lot of punk, of oomph anymore. It's mostly kind of just a bitter that stimulates digestion, might have a little bit of a mild sedative effect. 
but it just doesn't have the same oomph as it does when you actually get the milky sap. Um, I, I listened to a workshop at an uh, herb conference some while back where Christopher Hobbs and some other herbalists had been doing an experiment with, uh, with herbs where they had been taking uh, and gathering herbs and running them through one of these, uh, you know, really good quality juicers that juices like wheatgrass. And then they would do would take the juice and pour it into a fruit leather tray on a dehydrator and dehydrate the juice. Um, and they had done this with um, nettles, which they said left the nettles as being a really kind of salty uh, flavor. I mean, it really kept the mineral salts intact. But one of the plants they'd done it with was the wild lettuce. They had... Uh, uh, basically dehydrated the fresh juice of the wild lettuce. And they, they said that that was actually quite sedative and anodyne. So I, um, there again, it's a matter of the fact that you get this thing, oh, wild lettuce is good, and then people think, okay, well, you can put dried wild lettuce in a combination, and I have used it, but it just isn't as potent as, except when the plant's not actually fresh. Someone asked, where do you get your soil from, and how do I measure the nutrients in the soil? I, I I actually, uh, what I've done is I live in an area with a heavy clay soil. Um, so uh, it, it's, um, it, it's not, you know, a really great soil for gardening. So what I've done is I basically uh, tilled up the soil. Uh, the, at the dump, what they do is uh, all of the, the landscapers and everything who bring in their their branches and clippings and everything, they have a great big chipper there and they chip it up in piles and let it compost for a while and you can go get dump, you know, truckloads of this stuff for pretty cheap. So I got some of that. I actually got someone to bring me a load of manure. I uh, basically have tilled a lot of manure and the compost into the soil to lighten it. Um, in my raised beds that I built to grow my, my root crops, like my uh, carrots and and parsnips and so forth. I added uh, bags of uh, of sand. I went just went to the to the local um, uh, uh, what do you call it building supply store, you know, like the Home Depot or Lowe's, and got the cheapest you know, sandbags I could find because I wasn't looking for play sand. And I basically took them home and I dumped sand in and tilled that in too because that lightens the soil. Okay, you can have a sandy soil, a clay soil, and in between is a good loam that, that, that has a good mixture of kind of uh, smaller and larger particles as well as a lot of organic matter in it. So as I've tilled more, more organic matter into it every year, the soil gets lighter and uh, improves in tilth and gets more. Now I've got a lot of worms in my garden, um, and uh, the soil is definitely uh, getting better. I made a bed for growing potatoes this year because I've had a problems with potatoes because the soil was so heavy. And I made a row of, of for growing uh, some potatoes that's 20 feet long, and I put 10 bags of sand, so basically one bag of sand every two feet, along with lots of manure, lots of compost, lots of, of uh, you know, mulch kind of stuff that I'd had from the year before that got tilled in and to lighten up the soil. And I've got some potatoes that are growing really, really well that way. So just by, as you add more organic matter, it uh, encourages earthworms and microbes and everything in the soil. I basically have, like I said, used this book to kind of get an idea of what minerals might be deficient in my soil. You can actually, through uh, certain places, and I'd have to look up where, you can actually have your soil tested and get a full analysis of what uh, your soil is like, but that is like two or three hundred dollars, and it's something that mostly um, farmers would do. I also, in my garden, I, I make a, a, a spray, a foliar spray to feed my plants. Um, I use, um, I, I take the eggshells, because I'm looking for calcium, I take the eggshells uh, and, and stick them in a jar, and you know, keep pounding them in to get a jar full of eggshells. And then I pour vinegar in there and some water, let the eggshells soak to basically the vinegar dissolves the calcium and pulls it out. And then I add that uh, to a sprayer. I put in a little bit of kelp emulsion or a little bit of fish emulsion, uh, which is a natural fertilizer. I add, um, 
I sometimes, when I don't have eggshells, I actually take a little bit of, uh, of like the, the Nature C calcium from Nature Sunshine and dissolve that in a little vinegar to put in there. And then I also um, add a couple of drops per gallon of sunshine concentrate because that makes water wetter, meaning it disperses things better. And I add about a tablespoon of Nature's Fresh because I think the enzymes really help the plants to grow too. And then I go out uh, toward in, either in the early morning or in the evening, and I spray this all over the plants to foliar feed them. And it really makes them grow better and uh, gives them a lot of extra nutrients. And sometimes I also mix it up and pour it, you know, especially in the spring, just pour it around the base of the plants. So um, that's kind of how I fertilize my my garden and build up my soil. Um, and that's all the questions that we have. So uh, thanks for joining us. I hope that you had a, an enjoyable time. Uh, I've ever had tomatoes that got rotten on the bottom while ripening. Not where I live. Um, I'd have to go look up what that is because I don't remember. Uh, Someone said a Department of Agriculture or a similar organization that advises farmers should be able to tell gardeners where to get their soil tested. Yeah, and there are little test kits that you can get that test the pH of the soil and test for the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and, um, and potassium, the NP NKP, the notorious three that there's all, all the commercial fertilizers. And yes, you can water tomatoes too much. Especially uh, when I first was here, I, my tomatoes just like grew these horrendous vines and almost no tomatoes. And so I, um, I went to a farmer's market and saw the lady selling tomatoes. And I said, how do you get your tomatoes to grow? She says, well, she says, in this hot climate, when the temperature goes over 100, the tomatoes have a hard time setting uh, uh, fruit. And... Um, and so she says the way to get them to, to, they just grow more vines. So they just, you know, all the water soaks up into doing vine. She says the way to get them to set tomatoes is to stress them a little bit. So she only watered her tomatoes um, once a week for two hours so that they would set down deep roots and they would dry out a little bit in between and that would keep them from growing too many vines. I that hasn't worked quite as well for me. Um, so what I've done is I water them for one hour every three days, and that def definitely helps a lot, as well as adding more calcium to the soil, because calcium helps set fruits. Like, I find that I don't get really, I wasn't really getting really good peppers. They were kind of thin-walled, and they weren't going getting very big. But when I started using the eggshell spray, and then I take the crushed eggshells when I'm done and stick them around, the base of the pepper plants, um, the peppers got bigger, the peppers set better, the peppers got fatter. And someone said that that uh, thing with the tomatoes getting rotten on the bottom is called blossom and rot, and she said use Epsom salts and work them into the soil. So Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate, and uh, if sometimes if leaves are a little bit yellow, okay, that can also be a sign of magnesium deficiency. And... Uh, Sulfur-loving plants like uh, um, straw that like a little more acidic soil, like strawberries, will also like Epsom salts uh, to kind of get that sulfur in the soil. So, uh, and sulfur also helps protect plants against disease. So there's a lot of you know stuff that you could use that's natural in your garden as well as you know for yourself. And I love to grow my own food because I personally find that the food I grow myself is better than anything I can get in the supermarket. Uh, it's, it's fresher and it's fun and I was sitting here I've been harvesting like heads of lettuce every week and thinking oh there's another 250 head of lettuce organic lettuce you know or <laughs> that I just grew from a packet of just a you know a, a couple of dollars worth of seeds so anyway uh, thanks again for attending the tonight's webinar and uh, hope that you uh, had an enjoyable time and learned a lot of good information and we'll talk to you again uh, next month Good night.